Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing, this time an incredibly timely talk on security, open source security, and containers from our friends at Black Duck. Tim Mackey's with us. Um, we're going to let him do his presentation and talk all about the goodness of um, what Black Duck's doing there and some of its, um, with all the Apache strut accusations um, from Equifax, as that's the problem of the world. Um, Black Duck's going to help us figure out how to, how to solve those and, and prevent that stuff from happening um, and give us their, their, their insights into this space. So, um, Tim, without any further ado, I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself and your topic. Um, you can ask questions in the chat. Um, I'll try and answer them, or there's a couple other folks from Black Duck that are on, too. They may answer them, but we'll have live Q&A at the end. So, you go for it, Tim. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Diane, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Mackey. I'm a senior technologist with um, Black Duck Software. And uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about managing container risk. Uh, and this talk is going to be um, at a little bit higher level um, than just OpenShift specific um, for probably about three quarters of the talk. And then we're going to kind of dive down into uh, how this is all going to benefit an OpenShift environment and the container infrastructure and so forth. That's actually uh, what we all want to be using and deploying and being successful with in an OpenShift environment. So, I'm going to start out with a set of assertions. And my first assertion is going to be that um, from a development perspective, that we have for practical purposes baked security into our SDLC and that we've effectively followed a security driven development and deployment model that has developers being empowered with security information. Uh, security-driven release policies, trusted components that we have as part of our CI loop, security testing is baked in, that binary artifacts only get created if those policies are met and that we are signing things that we're supposed to sign and that uh, images are being stored in trusted container registries and that um, they're only deployed from those trusted registries. And that's my assertion, that's my starting point. Um, and if that's, those nine things are actually met. Um, the question then becomes, well, what could go wrong? Um, the sad thing is, is that quite a bit can actually go wrong. And so uh, CSO Magazine earlier this year uh, had an article out by Maria uh, Korolov that said the easiest way to get fired in 2017 was to have a security breach. Um, I don't know exactly how many people at Equifax are now potentially looking for jobs, but this is the reality that IT lives in today. And part of this is born on regulations that are global in nature. So for example, in the EU, there's GDPR. In Canada, there's uh, a proposed legislation called PIP EDA. And they're basically setting regulatory requirements for organizations that have personally identifiable information on their customer base uh, around how they disclose, how quickly they disclose, and the details under which they disclose with a set of penalties. And in the case of, say, GDPR, there's actually a percentage of revenue that's associated with those penalties. Um, in other scenarios, we've seen execs like the CEO of Target actually get uh, fired as a result of the breach they had a few years ago. And to kind of like focus this down a little bit, um, IBM and the Ponemon Institute annually put out a cost of data breach study. And there were three items in there that really caught my eye. The first being the average cost of the data breach being a little over 7 million, uh, and that the lost business from it was a little over 4 million. But the shocking number was that the length of time that it took to identify and contain a breach was a little over six months. Now, if we put it in perspective uh, with the Equifax breach from last week, it came out overnight um, that the attack vector that was used was an exploit of the Apache struts vulnerability uh, that was disclosed in March. And Equifax made a statement that uh, they discovered this in July, 29th of July to be specific, and that the data exfiltration that occurred uh, was from May through to then. If you take the March timeline for that struts uh, disclosure and move forward to the 29th of July, well, that's under six months, which means that um, as horrendous as it is to make this statement, Equifax actually did a better job than the average person or the average organization. So um, this is the type of world that we're actually living in. Now, a lot of people go and say, well, you know what? 
from an application perspective, it doesn't really matter. Our infrastructure guys have thought of everything. So if I look at a, a build out, I've got some users, some shiny happy people on the left, I've got some perimeter defenses and I've got my data center. And if I build out what's uh, a compute node inside of that data center, I may have a hypervisor in place uh, that has its own set of uh, services, which includes an SDN uh, network for ensuring that only the traffic that's supposed to be there is there. Um, I have some form of security service in place that is looking for malicious uh, activity within the virtual machines themselves. Um, I have obviously a virtual machine that is uh, going to be containerized and this allows me to have multi-tenanted segmentation. I'm going to have a minimal OS like uh, Red Hat Atomic and I'm going to have some number of containers in here and because this is a virtual environment, I'm going to replicate it to however many container VMs are necessary. If one of these containers happens to have a component that is vulnerable, things get interesting quickly. So we change our shiny happy people into a malicious actor. And now let's assert that that malicious actor was able to compromise that vulnerable container. Well, they're now on exactly the other side of all these perimeter defenses. And so they're now in a position where they could potentially mount an attack from a compromised container to another compromised container, despite all of these the structural rules that are in place, notwithstanding the fact that uh, a lot of the vulnerabilities that we see in web-based frameworks require a reconfiguration of perimeter defenses in order to even detect the patterns of attack. So the goal when trying to put security in place in a large-scale infrastructure is truly to question everything and continually reevaluate the trust of what's out there. So we should be looking at things like, where does your base image actually come from? If you're building it locally, when was it brought down? What is the health of that base image? Within the Red Hat Container Catalog, we have now a health index that is showing how up-to-date it is. Does it have any known CVEs in it? When, uh, what's the patch interval? What, what is truly the health of that image? Um, if you're uh, running through a set of build servers before, who trusts them? Do you trust them themselves? Is there a way that a foreign con container can start in your environment? Are you allowing, say, uh, an OpenShift template to come in? Are you allowing users to go and uh, access uh, containers that are referenced from Docker Hub directly? Do you have the providence in there? If you're building base images from outside, what happens if that registry goes away? What happens if the tag that you're beholden to goes away or changes? Uh, because after all, tags are immutable. Um, what's the process to determine the impact if there's a new security disclosure? All of these things are part and parcel to the trust model that needs to be put in place as we grow and as we mature. And if at this point you say, wow, my brain hurts and this is an awful lot of work, um, right, it is. Um, and yes, most people would be right in saying this is going to hurt their brain. So let's let's take a little bit more deeper dive into how we can better manage some of this. Because at the end of the day, um, we don't want anybody to get fired as a result of a data breach. The, these, these things are manageable if you understand the information flow. And so one of the things that challenges enterprises, and I'd be willing to bet that this is something that challenged Equifax, is that open source doesn't play by the traditional commercial proprietary software rules. Um, if you take a look at a pure upstream project, compared to commercial code, when a project decides that a given version is end of life, there's no opportunity to pay a boatload of money. There's no dedicated support team with SLAs. Uh, there's no staff of security researchers. There's no transactional relationship between a procurement house or a procurement team and a quote unquote vendor. Now, obviously, as you move uh, from pure upstream, um, you can get organizations like Red Hat who are going to very nicely provide support services and curation for all of this. But when we look at the infinity of open source, it is truly a community-based uh, activity. It's truly a scenario where if you forked, if you've done anything that's deviating from that distributed uh, component, ultimately you're the one who's responsible and you need to establish that relationship. So just kind of put a little bit of a point on it, if I look at this MediaWiki maintenance release announcement for versions 126, 25, 24, and 23, there are two key pieces that are in here. There's a security disclosure that says various special pages resulted in fatal errors. That's in the first yellow blob that I highlighted. That's the nature of the security update. So if you are a MediaWiki admin looking to determine whether this is appropriate or not to deploy at this particular point in time, that's the information that you're working with. 
The other thing is, is that there's also a note about end of life. And it says, please note that the 124.6 marks the end of the support for the 124 series of releases. Technically, this ended a few weeks ago. However, 124.5 had issues along with other versions, so it was thought, thought fair to fix them. So the community was trying to do the right thing, but they're baking the information in an interesting and different ways, which makes it a whole lot harder if you are on a security response team to determine if you are impacted by a specific uh, notification. And what we're seeing today is that attackers themselves are getting incredibly resourceful and you need to be just as resourceful, if not cunning in how you respond to it. So here we have a potential attacker and this attacker has a job to do. The job is to determine whether or not there is a set of vulnerabilities against a specific set of configurations or platforms. They create their attack and they test it against platforms and chances are, first couple of iterations don't go so well, but they're perseverant and they're going to iterate and eventually they're going to find something that's successful. Now that success might not necessarily be uh, something that supported the original thesis, but a success is a success, a success, is a, um, a success is a success and they're going to claim victory and move on. And so in order to move on, they have to create a deployment vehicle or utilize one of the multitude of deployment vehicles that are out there uh, to take this attack that they've now created and package it up for utilization. Now, they have a trust issue themselves. They need to be able to demonstrate that this in fact works. So in all likelihood, they go and they create a video, they post it up on YouTube showing exactly how their attack was able to compromise the system. Um, and gee whiz, isn't this a wonderful thing? You should be using it too. And if this looks a little bit like an SDLC, that's because it is. This person has a job to do. They're working for someone who has a, uh, an end goal of being able to build something out. But this is something that also happens a little bit um, off in the shadows. And occasionally, things like Equifax or, uh, as I referred to it, the PR department gets involved. And the nature of their vulnerability that's out there um, ends up getting a ton of publicity. And so that increases their credibility, increases the value of what they've accomplished. This is their business. And this is what we're collectively fighting against. So I talked a little bit about stuff that's theoretical. Um, I'm gonna actually make this incredibly real and decompose a specific vulnerability. And I'm going to decompose a vulnerability that was uh, made public through the process known as responsible disclosure. And so under that process, a security researcher uncovers an issue goes to whoever the project owner is and says, gee whiz, but if I do this, bad things happen and I assert that that's a security issue. Uh, collectively, they work together to determine exactly what the scope of it is and create patches. Uh, those patches are then uh, brought downstream into distributions. And the idea is that until those patches are actually released, Nobody outside of those core team members actually knows that the issue is happening or that that could be out there. So in decomposing this vulnerability, I've decided to choose a vulnerability from last fall uh, that impacted a lot of the systems that we're dealing with on a daily basis, specifically the Linux kernel. So this was an embargoed vulnerability, which is the term that's used uh, when you're working through responsible disclosure. It was given the name CVE 2016-5195, and CVE stands for Common Vulnerability Enumeration. 2016 just happens to be the year in which it was allocated, and 5195 just happens to be the sequence number that was associated with the block of numbers that this was run through. Nothing particularly fancy about it. Now, the upstream patch was created on the 18th of October by Linus. And this is his commit message. I highlight a couple of important pieces in here. First piece being, this is an ancient bug that was actually attempted to be fixed once 11 years ago, but that was then undone. So what we've effectively established is a set of commit IDs that I didn't highlight that go back 11 years and represent the timeline for this particular issue. Now there's a whole series of forks that happened over that uh, time period. So there's gonna be multiple uh, branches of the kernel that are going to be uh, impacted by the patches. Well, the next piece uh, that I wanna call out is the last uh, highlighted section, which says, also the VM has become more scalable. What was a purely theoretical race condition back then has become much easier to trigger. 
And so what that really is saying is, if we look back at the types of servers that we were working with 10, 11 years ago, they were single core machines, maybe there was some hyper threading, uh, we might have two or three socket, two or two or four sockets in there, three ever actually worked, um, two or four sockets uh, in there. So there wasn't a whole lot of concurrency. Race conditions love concurrency. Today you can get 12, 18, 24 core uh, sockets, and there's a ton of concurrency in there. Throw a second socket in, and you've just doubled the nature of the con concurrency. And when you're dealing with something that's a copy and write issue, as this was, um, race conditions can be particularly problematic. So this is Linus's commit message on the 18th of October. On the 21st of October, the embargo expires. There's tons of media coverage. Um, the silly Dirty Cow branding at dirtycow.ninja is created, um, where you can buy silly things in their shop, including uh, exorbitant price t-shirts and um, coffee mugs. Patches are available from uh, all major distributions, and the embargo's expired. And various people start to make uh, assertions, and the timeline moves forward. So in the US and Canada, we have a lovely little fall festival called Halloween, where people love to dress up in silly costumes, and kids dress up in silly costumes and go door to door and look for candy, and grown-ups party in their silly costumes. And we have a lot of fun at Black Duck. And um, well, this is Madeline. Madeline's one of our uh, field salespeople. And she decided that she was going to dress up as Dirty Cow as part of her team. Um, and they actually won a contest. And that's the 31st of October. Now, if you've got media coverage for this vulnerability, the logical place where you would expect to have security information would be in what's known as the National Vulnerability Database. The NVD, sometimes people refer to as MITRE, um, actually had no meaningful information on this vulnerability until the 10th of November. So that's roughly three weeks of uh, timeline from when the embargo expired, patches were available, people could dress in silly costumes, and there was still nothing from a security perspective that was disclosed. That's a pretty big time window for someone to mount a malicious attack, but there's a whole series of point in time decisions and information pieces that play into this. So when the embargo expired, various media outlets were asserting that, well, this was not remotely executable. It turned out that it was. That information came out uh, about six hours later when the researcher said, well, I figured this out by looking at my web logs. So yes, this is remotely executable. Uh, there were initial assertions that uh, virtualization meant that this was not exploitable. Um, that took the better part of a day to say, well, that depends on how the hypervisor is architected, and so some are and some aren't. Um, then there was about three days went by where people were asserting that if you were in a container, uh, that uh, the namespaces effectively prevented uh, that from occurring. If you look about halfway down the, the page of POCs, you'll see one that says deadbeef.c. Um, that's actually uh, a container breakout. Um, and that took uh, a little over three days for that to come out. Used a very interesting way of manipulating uh, the, the system in order to bring that forward. At this point in time, there's well over 80 uh, such proofs of concept out there. And so if you made your decision about how to go about patching this when the embargo expired, you exposed yourself to a different level of risk than if you were continuously reevaluating the nature of this particular vulnerability and the exploits that were out there. So all this timing is fundamentally opportunity. Some organizations look at security analysis as, you know what, I'm going to go and do a pattern static analysis, so fundamentally a covarity scan, for example. Um, others are gonna do some injection testing. Others are gonna do some fuzzing or some um, pen testing on the system. In reality, all of these techniques are focusing on the code that the individual is creating or the organization is creating, but they're not focused on upstream and they're not focused on the dependencies. That's where tools like vulnerability analysis, which is what Black Duck does, come into play. So in a full end-to-end -end security model, you wanna do static analysis, you wanna do injection, you wanna do dynamic analysis, but you probably aren't going to get buy-in from um, your leadership team to say run uh, static analysis on the Linux kernel or run it on the Docker engine or run it on uh, OpenShift components or run it on uh, your SDN controllers. 
that's going to be quote unquote somebody else's problem. That's where the vulnerability analysis comes in, looks at the composition of what you've got, and identifies vulnerable dependencies, which, as it turns out, most of those dependencies, most of those vulnerabilities are actually found by researchers. Now, one of the things that um, I really like highlighting is that we're all fundamentally researchers. When we uncover an issue that is potentially security uh, related, we should be working with the project and the project leadership and their security team to go and get those patches out and get that awareness out. There is a model for doing that with generic upstream open source projects. If you go to I want to see the e.org or the distributed weakness filing, um, you can see more information about exactly how to uh, approach upstream organizations with security issues that you see so that they don't remain latent and we don't have things like an Apache struts issue that runs back eight years because the bug was there that someone potentially might have known about and said, here's my workaround. I'm just going to work it around it as opposed to actually getting it resolved. And that timeline and that lack of resolution is how attackers find weaknesses all the time. So one of the things that um, we saw about this time last year was a 620 gigabit per second attack, uh, denial of service attack on krebsonsecurity.com. And this was done through some compromised IoT devices. Uh, think uh, doorbells, thermostats, nanny cams, EVRs, uh, refrigerators, dishwashers, microwaves, anything that's internet enabled, which is these days becoming pretty much everything. Um, the vector was actually through an open SSH vulnerability from 2004 with a flag allow TCP forwarding set to true. If you look at that particular disclosure's um, description, one of the things you'll notice is that it describes nothing like what we have today for a compute environment. Um, it does not describe IoT devices. It looks like it should be one of these ones where, yeah, this is legacy, it doesn't really impact me. If you dig just a little bit deeper, you'll find that this allow TCP forwarding flag is set to true. Inside the man page, it says that, well, this is not a security uh, issue. And I assert anytime someone says this is not a security issue, it probably is. And you should be having your spidey sense going, um, saying, yeah, we want to work on that. This is not a security issue because it needs to have a well-known password and be publicly connected in order to be exploited. It just so happened that a lot of these IoT devices had things like password of, say, admin admin or admin password. So all of a sudden, something uh, that shouldn't be an issue becomes a big issue. The Apache Struts vulnerability, um, this actually impacted um, the Canadian uh, Revenue Agency CRA, which is the Canadian equivalent of the IRS, right in the middle of the um, e-file tax season. And this had a little bit of um, extra press around it because they were proactive and reached out to the media to say, look, we are turning this e-file system off because we are vulnerable. We need to get this thing fixed. As it turns out, this same vulnerability from March is exactly what uh, impacted Equifax last week or became disclosed with Equifax last week. So res vulnerability response times matter, awareness matters when looking at things. And there's an incredible long tail. Um, we may want to uh, kind of point our fingers at Equifax and say, why did it take you so long? Uh, but we can equally point our fingers at the roughly 200,000 websites that are still vulnerable to Heartbleed, a three-year-old uh, vulnerability uh, in OpenSSL today. You would expect that that should be something that is just taken care of out of normal system hygiene. One of the things that this actually plays into is what uh, we look at as an open source development risk maturity model. And this is going to feel really familiar to most people. At level one, this is when we're worrying about features and functions. We really don't care what we're uh, bringing in, what our dependencies are. It's a state of blissful ignorance. We want to make something. We want to hit that MVP so that we can actually get something out there and find out that it solves the problem because that's actually what we care about. As we move forward and we find a few people forking it, we find a few people who've actually downloaded it and might be actually using it, um, we get a little bit of an awakening to understand how uh, the security implications of what we're going to be working with uh, should be attended to, uh, but we're still very much focused on features at this point in time. As we move forward, we get a level of understanding. We start throwing in some manual review processes, um, some 
fairly basic tooling. We might have some spreadsheets to keep track of stuff. We might try and look at some free or low cost tools and do security scans maybe prior to each release as opposed to going on an ongoing basis. Um, this is where a lot of projects are today. What we really want to get to is a state of enlightenment where we have automatic identification of all of the risks as they happen um, and as they're disclosed and we've baked all of this into our CI and CD uh, environments. So uh, from an OpenShift perspective, that would be, hey, can I bake this into uh, my build pipelines? Um, what kind of awareness do I have around my builders and so forth? So this is the model that we want to take forward and we want to automate. And there's a set of criteria that we put in place around what makes for uh, successful automation and highlights and extracts the best information flow. So the first thing we want to look at is the factors that impact risk. So item number one is a vulnerable open source component. Um, where, are they, where are all the dependencies coming from? Are the dependencies on the application side or on the, the user space side that's inside the container image? Um, is a component that we're dependent upon a fork or a true dependency? How is it being linked in? Um, these are factors that uh, go into the vulnerable open source uh, side of things. Point in time decisions are another problem. Um, we all want to use stable components wherever possible, but that stable might be end of life. And if end of life equates to dead, uh, we might have uh, a lot of responsibility and potential technical debt to attend. Um, are there change sets that are coming down the pipe that could make it a lot more difficult to actually update to a newer version if the need uh, dictates? API versioning issues. What is the security response process for the project? What is the commit velocity and who are the contributors and are they changing? Are they stable? Um, some of this information is actually coming out of a new initiative that the Linux Foundation announced on Monday uh, around uh, what they're calling the chaos project to understand exactly what the true health of upstream projects really is. Now, when we look at uh, historical data center operations, one of the things that's a hot topic is, well, how quickly have you patched? What's your patch process? What's your patch tooling look like? Well, in reality, we don't patch containers. We go and rebuild them. We might do some AB, we might put a canary out there, but fundamentally, we're not in the patching process when we're working with containers, but we do need to question that patch process. So there are a bunch of points in time where Apache struts became more vulnerable due to the nature of whatever was disclosed against it. If you happen to be at a version prior to that and upgraded to a version that was worse, did you actually move from the frying pan into the fire? Are you the fish? Are you the person controlling what's going on? Question that process. We want to make certain that we're supporting the gating of uh, container builds so that when something happens in the outside world and a decision that the developer made was perfectly legitimate this morning uh, becomes completely problematic due to a vulnerability disclosure this afternoon, that when the build occurs, that we're performing a risk assessment, tossing a ticket into a defect system like JIRA, but among other things, we're not actually creating that container image so that it can't actually be deployed um, because if you didn't create it in the first place, well, it's kind of hard to deploy it. So make certain that these gating activities are actually happening. We want to build a risk profile for every single container in the system, even builders. So if I'm uh, doing a source to image and my Git environment changes and I've got uh, the source to image build that's going to toss it into the internal OpenShift reg registry and I've got my triggers and my deployment triggers in place, if a vulnerable component comes in through uh, Git workflow, it makes sense that you might have some vulnerabilities in your container. But what happens if that builder container is similarly uh, impacted? You still have the potential for a vulnerable container deployment, and so you need to have that awareness. Same thing is true when you have uh, a build pipeline and what steps that you have within uh, your build environment. If the build pipeline itself has some issues, um, can you actually trust that resultant container? If the various scans and staging activities also have uh, issues, they too can uh, produce problematic results when you go to deploy. And the last piece of the puzzle is around uh, ongoing changes in risk. So if we assume that we've got every single test done and we've got a shiny happy object and a new disclosure happened say 40 minutes ago, we don't want to be in the business of continuously scanning our running containers because that's going to impact the performance and scalability of our system. 
What we want to do is take advantage of the fact that the container images themselves are immutable, perform the risk assessment on the immutable object, aka the container image, monitor for the composition that's associated with that container image and map that back to the outside world and say, look, here's a new security issue, toss a ticket into JIRA, let's have that workflow in place. And so have a more scalable system as a result of being able to monitor through. Now, from the Black Duck perspective, we have a solution that uh, historically has been geared towards the developer experience and the release engineering experience. So being able to, for example, provide security information within the Eclipse IDE or Visual Studio IDE, work with the various package managers, integrate within CI uh, tool chains from pretty much every CI out there integrate within the security, uh, the static and dynamic analysis tools. So if you're, for example, going through a MicroFocus Fortify, um, that you've got the pieces in place. Wherever the artifact storage is, that we can uh, scan with that. What we've done um, over the course of the last um, eight, nine months is bring all of this into the OpenShift world. And that's where I'm gonna go and, and look next. So our initial design philosophy was that security response times are too long that from the point at which an actual disclosure is made to the time you determine exactly what portion of your infrastructure is impacted is far too long. And with the rate of new disclosures coming out, uh, it's something that is going to be very, very difficult to keep up with. And so we wanted to make certain that we automated everything associated with and this is our, our, our basic architecture. We have a knowledge base that we host, um, partly because it's about 500 petabytes in size, uh, petabytes, 500 terabytes in size is about to become a petabyte. Um, and most people don't really wanna be in the business of hosting that. Every other aspect of the solution is actually customer hosted. So our core application is called uh, the hub. And we have, uh, essentially it's a hub and spoke kind of scenario where various integration elements hang off of that. If we look at the OpenShift, uh environment and this can be uh an enterprise deployment this could be an origin deployment they all work exactly the same way i have the potential for an integrated registry and i have image stream events that are going to hang off of that obviously i have the potential for an external registry that could be the red hat container catalog that could be docker hub that could be your own internal uh artifact or your nexus repository what we do is we actually put in place uh some integration elements are designed around being able to listen for activities that are happening in the system that relate to immutable container objects. So a new image stream is created that's associated with an image that is within the uh, registry's purview. We'll see that create event. We'll also see an update and delete on it as well. We'll also see pod creation events so that if a container image is brought in from outside uh, the integrated uh, environment, uh, we'll be able to see that when we see it, we'll go and perform an assessment to determine whether or not it needs to be scanned. If it needs to be scanned, we go and we perform that scan. Scan results go up to Hub, and Hub goes and takes a look at that bill of materials and maps it against our knowledge base to go and say, here's what the risk is. Risks are assessed, uh, are assessed by our policy engine, which then goes and communicates everything back into the scan controller and ultimately annotates the images. And so those annotations are actually pretty interesting. Um, so with uh, Origin uh, 1.6 and OpenShift uh, Enterprise 3.6, um, we actually have a, a spec in place where those annotations can actually be used within an emission control workflow to decide that, you know what? This image is okay to deploy. This image was okay to deploy. Now it's not so great. And of course, the outside world is continually changing, so the policy engine will update as the outside world changes, and we'll get new notifications coming in, which will also update those uh, annotations, ensuring that the state of the system is, say, no more than an hour out of date. So effectively, what this boils down to is that had, theoretically, Equifax been using uh, OpenShift in this application that was uh, the, the attack vector that we've all been talking about for the better part of the last week. We would have been in a position to actually let them know exactly which images were impacted within an hour of that disclosure back in March and continuously monitor for any changes so that even if a developer happened to revert to an older version, um, because that's what they needed to do, that we could have flagged it as that happened. That's our piece of the puzzle, but 
we want to make certain that we are truly layering container security. And the success criteria for uh, a, a truly trusted environment starts with the platform. Uh, so OpenShift as the platform uh, with the Project Atomic host, um, locked down with all the appropriate um, SE Linux uh, enforcing settings in place, using Open SCAP uh, to administer all of the various uh, policy and governance rules to ensure that uh, there aren't any misconfigurations within the user space or for that matter uh, on the, uh, the, the Kubernetes nodes. Um, map that against the patch definitions for all the Red Hat products. That takes care of all of the core Red Hat side of the equation. But that still leaves the infinity of uh, of open source, and that's where we take over. Uh, and so we literally scan any and all container images uh, in an OpenShift deployment, including our own, uh, providing visibility into the open source components regardless of the source, annotating those images with the vulnerability information, and automatically updating them with new disclosure information as that occurs without any need for rescan, without any human involvement. It's completely automated and integrated within the system. So um, I've bored everyone with some slides. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a risk here and try and um, do a little bit of a, a demo. Uh, Diane, how are we doing for time? You're doing fine. If you okay, could do, do me one favor and hide the bar that's at the bottom of your, of your screen that says stop sharing in the next oh. one. Here you go. Thank you. Apologize <laughs> for everyone. That was I thought it was only my side. Okay. So let's go and... So well, I'm going to show exactly how easy it is to install. Actually, you know what? I'm going to show what we've got. Next, and I'm logged in in the right place. So here's my OpenShift console. Probably going to want me to log in again. And I actually have a uh, project called Black Duck Scan, which I'm going to delete right now. And the Black Duck Scan project is our integration um, elements. Um, and so once it's actually completely deleted itself and all the uh, container infrastructure underneath it, we'll go and we'll refresh. There we go. So I'm going to install. And during installation, I'm going to ask for incredibly difficult questions, like where is my hub server? Which just happens to be right here. What's my username, password? Select a version of my hub server. I happen to know that it's version 3.7.1. I'm going to go with two concurrent scans to make this go just a little bit faster. For the most part, this is the value that people will use. Occasionally, if the nodes are smaller, we recommend going with one concurrent scan. And in very large clusters, we've seen three to be beneficial. It goes and creates all of the components. And if I go back to my OpenShift console, I'll see that the Black Duck Scan project in place. And I have a total of five containers that are here. Now my infrastructure itself has four nodes. And the way that this is architected, um, we have a daemon set that is on each of the uh, worker nodes. And the daemon set is listening for any activity related at the node level to images being created and deployed. When it uncovers a, an image that might need to be scanned, uh, it will then go and ask for permission uh, from the arbiter itself. And so I'm going to go and take a look at our pods. I'll take a look at the arbiter. And we see right now he's going and assigning a variety of jobs uh, to ensure that the scans of all of these uh, fully qualified containers are being performed. If I look at a controller, the controller actually consists of um, two containers. One's a sidecar, uh, which is the scan engine uh, that isn't being used, and the other is the actual um, uh, scans that are being performed. 
from a usability perspective, I could kill any one of these things off and they would restart themselves because that's what cloud native computing is all about. At the end of the day, these scans are being uh, performed and the information is coming up into our hub. Uh, which I'm going to log into. And what we see is a set of projects that are created uh, and in each of them, there's going to be some amount of registry information. So this 172301310, that happens to be the um, console that uh, is associated with this OpenShift environment. So, um, we have multiple OpenShift environments that are coming in. Uh, if an image is coming from Docker Hub, it won't be fully uh, qualified. Sometimes we get ones from Docker IO that are. Uh, we'll also be scanning things that are coming out of the Red Hat Container Catalog as they're used. And so I'm going to go and take a look at this, uh, this image here, Hub Documentation. The version is the first uh, 10 characters of the pull spec, uh, so that's completely immutable. And I see all of the components that are actually in here. So there are 221 components that are part of this particular application. And there's some Hibernate pieces in here. There's uh, some uh, things that are coming along completely for the ride as a result of the user space. Uh, and in this case, there are 19 components that have a high severity vulnerability associated with them. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, what do I want to pick on? Maybe I'll pick on uh, Tomcat. And see what we have from a Tomcat perspective. Um, I have some new vulnerabilities in place. I can see exactly what the record is. Get a deeper view of uh, what's in here, uh, descriptions, how exploitable it is, um, see some references. And a lot of the time, uh, we're going to be able to get to things like um, discussions around uh, the particular uh, fix. Um, being able to uh, occasionally find the actual uh, exploit code uh, so that you can actually test it against it. These are all part of the normal things that we, we have with a specific vulnerability. But importantly, if I go, uh, this one was a uh, Tim Arpachico. Uh, so if I go to the Tim project and I go and take a look for images, I'll find Arpachico, and I'm going to look at this snapshot. This is some of the annotation information that ends up being put in place. So I can see the server that this was running on, the version that was there, what the endpoint is, um, and this quality.images.openshift.io.policy.blackduck. This is the specification that I was referring to earlier, where I'm now able to flag that this is not a non-compliant uh, policy. Uh, and so if I had emission control uh, in place that prevented uh, non-compliant policies from uh, allowing for container execution, this would automatically be managed by that emission controller. So we bake all this information in so that the entire interaction with the Black Duck Hub user interface is something that's not necessarily going to be a requirement for uh, an operations user. They can go and read out these annotations, bring them into a Sysdig or a Datadog and do the right things uh, based off of the, uh, the information that's present there. Uh, and that's one of the, the second key elements that we have is that we're not forcing people into our, uh, our UI who don't necessarily need to be there. We're not forcing it from an automation perspective. So it gives a very easy, quick installation, quick results as to what uh, the state of these container images are. And so I'm gonna go back to my next slide. And I mentioned about the Black Duck knowledge base, um, a critical component behind all of this, um, because it, at the end of the day, it's pretty straightforward to figure out a way to scan an image. And you could just decide to go and attach to a, the registry and export them all. Um, how you actually do the mapping, that's where the magic comes in. So our knowledge base has been around for a little over 12 years now. It was designed uh, with an understanding of how forks, forks of forks, parallel streams of development that might actually be merged back in as feature elements. But those are actually, that's normal open source. That's what you want to see. Um, we enhance all that security information that we're collecting from the world 
with the security research team that today numbers uh, a little over 50 people. We're updating as the security issues occur. So even when uh, the struts uh, update of S2052 and S2053 came out last week, we had those in uh, and fully mapped through within an hour. And being able to map those to public exploits is, is really crucial. At this point in time, we're half a petabyte of storage, um, but we're pulling in uh, open source information from about 10,000 different data sources, um, where all of GitHub counts as one of them. Um, and oddly enough, I update these, uh, these stats once a, a quarter. In the last three months, we've gone and increased the number of data sources by 1,000. I'd really love to see exactly what those are, um, and that's on my list to do when I get back to the office. The goal that we have is to be able to have full end-to-end -end visibility, to be able to inventory those components that are in place, map them to known security issues, identify those risks, manage them to your governance policies, and alert when the world changes around and do this in a 100% automated uh, way that requires no human interaction. And that for practical purposes, if a human tried to get in the way, um, that we would be able to detect that the human is messing with the system and maybe trying to uh, prevent scans from happening, as an example. The end objective, of course, is to stay out of the news for the wrong reasons. Um, we don't want any of our employers to be in the news for what you see on the screen right now. Um, that's pretty bad. That's not necessarily going to get anybody um, any awards, um, but it actually could be a little bit worse. Um, you really don't want to be in the news for this. Um, having your employer go before Congress to explain why they didn't do what they thought they were doing in the first place, that's not going to help anybody. So that, that's it for my presentation, but I do want to take this opportunity to do a little bit of a, a promotion. Um, Black Duck has its user conference. It's called Flight. Um, Flight 2017 is being held in Boston at the Seaport Hotel and World Trade Center. If um, anyone watching this uh, recording went to uh, Red Hat Summit earlier this year, that's the same area. Um, it's being held uh, the 7th to the 9th uh, of this year, and we've got some really, really good content packed in here uh, around DevOps and security, research and innovation. We'll have some of our researchers over who will be able to uh, explain some of the techniques that they're using to simplify the security management. Well, it sounds um, like a really good event, too, you know, and, and it's this, this is one of those things where um, it's you could go down the wormhole and ask tons of questions about each and every one of them, but I, I think. Um, the, these kinds of uh, sessions and, and this event will probably be a really good way for anyone who's in the sysadmin or security or even developers who are working on applications to get a better understanding of where the risk factors are too and where they're coming from. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> completely. And and the registration code they put down there, Tim99, um, that's the special code that we put together for um, and the open source events that we we do that gets you in for 99 dollars um so that's a a huge huge savings for anyone who has to uh justify to their boss that flying into boston is um, a little bit pricey yeah well and boston's wonderful so yeah, yeah I, i'd encourage everybody who, who has a chance to, to get and, and come and hear this because there'll be lots of folks i think um one of our folks uh, gordon half is going to be speaking at that event as well um, that is correct we do have gordon yeah, and, and we probably will be kicking off a security SIG in the OpenShift Commons shortly. Um, so we'll try and um, incorporate some of that in the upcoming Austin event in December um, at KubeCon that we're having an OpenShift Commons gathering there as well. So security has been top of mind for a lot of folks here. I, you know, there, there haven't been any questions in the Q&A on the side in the chat because I think um, everybody's just been sort of entranced and uh, I think you did a very nice job of, of demoing how to deploy and, and use it all on, on OpenShift. But I, I kind of wanted to make a comment about you're going to, um, the one thing you don't want to do is get fired for any of this stuff. But if even with all of the automation, if people ignore the warning signs um, and, and don't do it, this is a perfect audit trail for why you would get fired because the auditors would have all of the information there to figure out when you were notified and um, you chose to ignore it. So there's, there's a little back and forth. And as someone who used to write auditing software, auditing software, uh, this, is, this stuff is really, the metadata is now there all tagged and the annotations, it's 
it's actually quite wonderful if you're a compliance officer in any company as well. Yeah, and, and to your point about the uh, the auditing, Diane, um, one of the things that I assert is um, uh, what, what makes for the lags that we're seeing, such as what we have with Equifax, is the sheer volume of what's coming in mm -hmm. and the uncertainty of, is this my, uh, do I have to, for example, scan my entire data center? Or is it only in this area and these types of analysis that need to go into it? If you have a tool that can go and say, these are the applications which are using this thing that has now become problematic, even though it wasn't yesterday, um, focus here. That should hopefully help with the velocity of fixes. And even if you can't necessarily get it down to an instantaneous fix, at least you can get to that uh, runbook for how to resolve it, implement that remediation plan a whole lot quicker. Yeah, and in, in one thing we we think that automations is gonna is gonna save the world and everything, but it's also um, like some of the stuff that we built in with OpenShift and the annotations from Black Duck give us the, the ability to block an image from being deployed, and I think that's really useful too, or at least throw up some um, steps before something could get redeployed or um, respawn up. So I think this is. This, this is all um, great stuff, and uh, I really appreciate that it's here because it saves our butt quite often. Um, and we're really happy that you guys are doing this. And the work, um, so as much as the, the Equifax folks have been blaming this on open source things, it's really all of the pieces and parts are in place to have good automation of and, and secure open source usage in your applications, in your enterprise, and a, a bit of it's FUD. Um, and a bit of it's, um, but, uh, but there's a good dose of reality too, especially when you were talking earlier about the dead ending of projects and there's nobody um, maintaining them. And if you're if depending on a, an open source project that there is no maintenance um, or upgrade path, um, th those kinds of things are big uh, risk factors that need to be taken into account. But this, the same thing can happen with a commercial company too. It's like a commercial company can go under and regardless of the SLAs, if, they're, if they disappear, they disappear. Yep, that's, that's completely true. And it's it really comes back to if your organization is dependent upon something, you need to be engaged with that dependency in whatever manner, um, yeah. commercial relationship or community. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, Tim, for taking the time today to, to talk to us about this. Um, there'll be, um, this will get posted on the OpenShift blog shortly, um, and we'll put up the links in here um, that you found, and um, we'll shoot it out over the internet and over the social channels, and hopefully we'll get you back again, and um, we'll see some of those lead times chunking down from under, two, to under 200 days or so, um, and it won't be around a dirty cow or a or a heart bleed. It's just hopefully we'll we'll have a good good story to tell um, with some reduction in those times. We can hope. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. All right. Take care.